Hello and welcome to the Launchpad. This is an offshoot of the Startup Storefront podcast where we talk to the founders of companies that are just getting started and whose stories we find compelling. Today we talk with Erica Rankin, founder of the edible cookie dough company, Brodo. It's a guilty pleasure we've all indulged in at least once or twice. The problem has always been that those raw eggs make it dangerous for consumption prior to being baked to golden perfection. Brodo isn't your grandparents' cookie dough though. It's vegan, safe for consumption, and packs an extra dose of protein. In fact, though you can indeed bake it, this is a cookie dough that is meant to be eaten raw. So listen in as we cover everything from the benefits of being open and honest on LinkedIn, why she often takes the path of most resistance, and how her dad wasn't quite convinced there was a market for cookie dough. That is until he saw the sales come rolling in. Hang on, hang on. If you're not subscribed, can you go ahead and do that right now before we get on with the video? Helps us out tremendously. That's all we ask. And we're back. All right, everyone, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Erica, founder of Brodo. Erica, thanks for joining. Please tell us a little bit about what your company does. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. So my name is Erica. I'm the CEO and founder of Brodo, which is Canada's first and only 100% vegan, protein-infused, better-for-you edible cookie dough. It contains an average of five grams of plant-based protein per serving, 10 ingredients, and it's 100% vegan. So all plant-based ingredients. Canada's first. What a line. I love that. What made you want to start the company? Are you a cookie dough fanatic and we're just looking for a healthier option? I guess just like a bunch of things. I've always been really passionate about better for you foods. And in 2018, like I got pretty involved in the fitness industry. I competed in bodybuilding competitions. So I would take my favorite sweet recipes and like manipulate them and make them healthier. So I would do this with everything, including cookie dough. And I saw a hole in the market here in Canada. Like we don't have my product. So that's why I created it. It's also a super nostalgic treat for me too. I've always wanted to enter a bodybuilding competition. Just kidding. I've never have, but I would if I could eat whatever I want, because all my friends who have done it, they're always complaining. They're always like, it's just chicken and broccoli and it's steamed and they're dying for flavor because you have to stick to the super strict regimen in order to see the results, which makes total sense. But I like that. I like that your approach was, let me make something that's not so healthy, healthy. As you were doing it, when did you start to maybe realize like, okay, I'm on to something. My friends like it. I like it. When was that? What were the signals that you said, okay, let's, let's launch into maybe making this a real thing. Yeah. So I never envisioned myself being an entrepreneur ever. Like I would just, it was a hobby for me, like making like these healthier versions of my favorite sweet treats and putting them on Instagram. And I started to get a following and I had people like recreate them and post them and tag me and people would message me and ask me if I would ever sell them. And I was like, no, this is just a hobby for me. Like, I don't really see a business out of it. And then I went backpacking across Southeast Asia for four months and I started meeting entrepreneurs from all over the world. And at that moment I was like, Hey, like this is totally doable. I never was exposed to this lifestyle growing up in a really small town. So I was like, okay, like got home, sat down with myself, saw, yeah, a need for the, my product in the market here in Canada. And it's something I'm extremely passionate about. And I launched it several months later. Cause I kind of sat on it because it's kind of scary when you launch your business and you hit publish on that on your Shopify store, you're like, oh God, it's real. Like, what are my parents going to think? What are my friends going to think? Like I told my parents, I remember like sitting in my dad's living room and I was like, this is what I'm going to launch. Like I showed him the logo, like the name. And he's like, what? <laughs> he's like, you're going to launch a cookie dough company. And I'm like, yeah. And it's going to work. And like, he didn't really understand it for the longest time until like these past few months when I told him what my sales were. And he was like, huh, people are actually buying it. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's a business dad. <laughs> When you were there with these entrepreneurs, what was it that made you think, oh, this is achievable? Was it that they were just like you? Like there was nothing magical about these individuals on this hike, right? Because I think a lot of people like almost with NBA players or people that are seemingly successful, the illusion of success, we always concoct this notion that, oh, this person must be super intelligent or went to this super amazing school or is already sitting on boatloads of money or has a trust fund or whatever idea people put out there. And then you meet some of them and like, at least for me, I'll be candid with you. I met a bunch of entrepreneurs that have sold their companies for like $900 million. And I was like, that guy's kind of dumb. I'm like, how the heck did he do that? And it was this moment of like, if this guy can do this and it, you know, 
That sounds wrong, but that's that was like literally how I felt. And then it became entrepreneurship became super approachable all of a sudden. Yeah, no, 100%. Like I can totally understand that. For me, like imposter syndrome, like it's it's always there for me. Like it just gets quieter and I learn how to deal with it better. But like, yeah, I felt super underqualified and like meeting all these different people, hearing their stories. I'm like, this person is, I'm just as qualified as this person to run a business. So why don't I? And I think like the aha moment was like, I don't know, seeing people and seeing how excited they were and passionate they were about what they were doing. And I was like, hey, you don't have to hate your your work life like you can mix your passion with business and like actually enjoy working which is something that i've never done before totally yeah i always tell people like i feel like i'm always working but never working but the thing is to go back to your imposter syndrome thing you feel lazy right like if i'm not working or i don't feel like i'm working it makes me feel lazy and i'm like am i being lazy and i'm like no i'm not but if you've ever had a job like a nine to five you're constantly trying to churn something out. You're constantly like, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me do this for a result. And that is totally debunked when it comes to entrepreneurship. What have you learned in terms of dealing with imposter syndrome that has helped? Like you say, how do you silence that voice? What kind of tricks do you use to calm it? I just started saying yes to myself, like opportunities like this, coming on podcasts, telling my story. It's kind of like, I have that little voice in my head that's like, okay, you're only a year in, like, you don't really know what you're talking about, blah, 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 you know? But I think going against that and like taking the path of most resistance and not least resistance and not taking the easy way out all the time, kind of doing things that contradict that voice, getting in the pattern of doing that. And sometimes I do catch myself saying no to opportunities, but, and then I, I catch on and I'm like, okay, no, I need to like let myself do this. And it helps you grow too when you start saying yes and giving yourself more opportunities. That's super smart. Yeah. I dealt with it for probably like three months straight where it would live in my dreams. Like it, at night is when I would do it. It actually happened last night. So we're right now we're building this coffee shop and behind it is our podcast studio in West Hollywood. And I was like, my whole dream was about nobody coming to the coffee shop. <laughs> and it's like this iconic thing. Like we, we put a car inside of a building and that car is going to serve people coffee. And it's like a 1964 French vehicle. And I'm like, this is a smash. But in my dream, nobody's there nobody's showing up for months and I'm just like how did I get this wrong you know and I've I've learned that uh imposter syndrome is like the most selfish thing about you in the sense of when you have it once you enter that headspace nothing's getting better the world isn't getting better and for some reason like knowing that it's selfish made me want to correct it knowing that that space is not helpful at all to anything or anyone around me was like oh I don't want to be selfish I need to get out of this mindset Let's go back to Brodo. Yeah, I was actually curious about the recipe for Brodo when you were creating it. So we just talked with Denise of Partake Foods, and she was trying to create her own recipe, but just kind of failing at it. Her daughter hated everything she tried. So eventually she was she realized her own weakness and hired a food scientist to create it for her. I'm curious about your journey in creating this recipe for Brodo. Is it your own? Did you have to go outside for any help in creating it? And, and how did that process go about? So it was a lot of trial and error. Like I kind of looked at like the traditional cookie dough. I'm not going to name the brand, but it's blue and in a tube and we all eat it. But uh, I looked at their like ingredient deck and I was like, okay, what can I swap out? What can I use instead of white granulated sugar or instead of white flour? What can I use instead of that? So a lot of trial and error and just putting things in a bowl and hoping that it would taste good. So the base formula I came up with on my own. And then down the road, I ended up having a few consulting sessions with a food scientist because food science is a thing and I had no idea. And there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way. And especially with like shelf life, that's something that I struggled with as well because before like I had my product in the fridge and the shelf life was a lot shorter when I could have been storing it in the freezer. So I kind of like made adjustments as the business grew and time went on. And also like the food scientists also helped me we kind of went through the process of how I manufactured the product and there are certain things that I did in an in incorrect order. So we kind of like swap things around, like adding in the liquids towards the end would extend the, the shelf life or like having less water activity would extend the shelf life and the pH a certain way, all these different things come into play. And I'm not a food scientist. I don't really know anything in that realm. I kind of just like baking and tasting things and <laughs> How many different flavors do you have right now that you're offering the market? A lot. <laughs> uh, I think I have around 10, I want to say. Um, I try to introduce a new one every two-ish months. 
Um, but when we go to market in the summer, I'm going to cut it back to four SKUs. I imagine you have like four bangers. Like these are the ones, you know, your greatest hits collection of these 10. Like these are what, what are the ones that you swear by or like the market just loves? What are those flavors? So like the OG chocolate chip, everyone loves that one because you can't go wrong with it. Um, cookies and cream, pinata party, which is kind of like an explosion of everything. Like there's sprinkles, there's white chocolate chips, dark chocolate chips, rainbow chocolate chips, white Oreos, regular Oreos, and then uh, tuxedo brownie. So it's like a cocoa based one with white chocolate chips in it. That's awesome. I, I just think about it like if I were to have one of these, I'd probably not eat anything else. I would probably just magically find myself eating Brodo. Yeah, an entire jar must be a single serving for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever thought about, I know right now you're, you're in Canada launching all over the country. Are there big differences between launching in Canada and then maybe growing to the United States in terms of food? Have you done, I don't know where you're at in your company, but I'm sure you've thought about it. Yeah, like the States, I think too, like as an entrepreneur and you get big eyed, right? And I see so much opportunity everywhere, but it's like crawl, walk, run, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and the market is so much bigger in the US and the opportunity, it's like they're, they're endless over there. The market's really small in Canada, but I need to like really master my own backyard and then eventually we'll figure out the US. And when that time comes, like I have to get new uh, labels made, new packaging have to get it likely manufactured in the states versus getting it brought across the border like there's a bunch of different things to consider when i when i get out that way eventually and then in terms of where your company's at in, in funding did you bootstrap this are you raising capital do you plan to raise some capital this year where are you at financially so i have bootstrapped it i got really scrappy like up until this point and had no debt at all i ended up taking out a line of credit so I'm kind of going to stretch that and use that for a while. I'm also going to launch either a Kickstarter or something like that soon, um, just to help with funding for my first production run. And then I think later this year, I'll start fundraising. That's super smart. Yeah. Kickstarter is the best, basically free money, no equity, just fans really. And you can give them like free product and create a community and loyalty around your company, which is, uh, you know, I think the most important part you launched this company during COVID. What's changed for you? Have you seen people buy this product more because we're all at home? And so like I can imagine myself personally, I, I probably my ice cream intake has gone up during COVID. What has that been like for you? What have you seen from the market? So in terms of like e-commerce, it's been really good. I remember I think it was maybe in April, like right after well, quarantine started or lockdown started. Uh, I ran a few paid ads and they performed really well. And like my sales just like skyrocketed and I was like, what's going on? And then I looked and at the analytics of my ads and they performed really well because everyone's at home, they're sitting on their couch, scrolling on Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, so in that like channel, like e-commerce, solid. But then in terms of like wholesaling to smaller stores, that was really hard because stores were opening, stores were closing. They didn't really want to take on new products. So I was unable to really... I guess, grow that way in wholesale, but yeah, e-commerce, it was good. <laughs> That's awesome. And is there a shelf life to your product right now? Yeah. So frozen, it's like nine months. Okay. I'm in the process of working with an R and D team and I'm going to actually have it sent in and analyzed again when I kind of have the new finalized product done. But on un unfrozen. So once it's thawed, how long does it last in your fridge? So it's like two and a half months in the fridge. That's great. Yeah, after opening it, it, it tastes best um, within two weeks, but can be 30 days open. That's the hard part of this whole game, right? It's like everybody wants fresh, but it's hard to get a product that's stable. And then shelf life becomes an issue, especially for the grocery market. So it's kind of like this impossible task. And there's a balance there because you don't want to sacrifice too much taste, but it's super hard. You know, I really wanted to chat about something that I'm just a fan of yours. It's like your social media presence is so amazing. And I think it feels so natural. Like it seems like you're just being yourself and there's parts where you're being goofy and parts where you're just sharing like, here's my day and today kind of sucked. You know, it's clear to me that people are connecting with that. And then particularly on LinkedIn, it seems like you're killing the game there. What, I hate to say strategies, but I guess what made you want to lean into LinkedIn and, and just sharing your content the way that you do? Thanks. Yeah. I got on LinkedIn in September or October, basically because I had nowhere left to go. I was working on my business and I was like, well, 
how do I grow it? I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to take it to the next level. So I had a friend and he's like, get on LinkedIn. Like you can meet so many different people who can help you. So I went on and I didn't really start posting every day, like actively until probably December or January. But I kind of looked around and I was like, well, no one's really talking about like all the hardships or the shit they go through. Um, everyone kind of just posts like, oh, I got into the X amount of stores or I closed 2 million fundraising rounds like today, whatever. Um, so no one was really posting the lows and I felt really discouraged because I would have these really hard days and I would look around and I couldn't really relate to anyone. I'm like, am I going through this by myself? And then I started having conversations with more and more founders and they're like, yo, I had this shit happen to me and this happened to me. And I'm like, why don't y'all talk about it? Why don't you post it? So that's why I started posting it because I just wanted to like create relatable content. And if I can help one person and I'm putting myself crying on the internet, that's totally fine. I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I never really realized how much it resonated with people until like the past few months, probably when people started messaging me and reaching out and they're like, thank you for showing everything and not just the highs and being transparent. So yeah, that's kind of what, what motivated me to post it was to just show people that, yeah, like there are good days, but there are even more bad days and it's okay. <laughs> I love that. I think that's the whole thing about podcasting too. It's like, you can really hear from the founder and at some point it switches your loyalty, let's call it to the brand or what you think is the brand to all of a sudden like, oh, wow, there's like a real human behind this. And they're not like, they're really putting it out there for us every single day in order to get this product to your hands. And it connects people with the brand in a completely different way, which is, um, you know, I think the way to go, we've had people on that have sold their companies. And as they're, as we release the podcast, it's like the first time that his investors or her investors hear the full story of what they went through. And they're like, oh my God, like the investors are responding like i had no idea what you're so amazing and this is after exit you know this is like eight years later and you're like what <laughs> and even like and i guess too some of the platforms don't don't really make it easy right like TikTok is really just entertainment so if someone's complaining i don't see that video doing super well and instagram is kind of moving in that direction too so i, I think linkedin probably provides the appropriate space for that and long form content too what are you working on right now? What's next for the company? How do you view 2021 shaking out? Yeah, it's kind of like an awkward period right now because I'm struggling to keep up with demand myself. Like I manufacture the product. I store the product in my living room. I ship it out from my living room. Um, I'm kind of a one woman show right now. And I'm having conversations with co-manufacturers all over. We've probably spoken to 15 different ones and only two are willing to work with me um, being a startup and having like a lower volume. Sure. It's a little tricky. So we're speaking with the co-manufacturer. I'm going to get that locked and loaded and hopefully launching nationally um, later this summer and then figuring out the e-commerce with the perishable product in the summer. That's another thing that I'm kind of working on too. So you basically just need a bigger space, right? Is that kind of where you're at? Yeah, bigger space. And I need to offload certain things onto someone else. Like I'm going to be completely honest. I hate making the product. I used to like it and I hate it. I hate going into the kitchen for like six or seven hours. I hate putting it all in my car and my little wagon and bringing it back into my condo and putting it in my freezer. So to have someone do that for me will be so nice. I do not know how companies do this for years because it's been a year and a half for me and that is plenty. <laughs> is it something that you hate because you feel it takes away from things you could be doing to help grow the business outside of that? Because it's, it's kind of the same thing where I feel it sometimes with this podcast in the sense that I spend a lot of time editing it and touching up the episodes and it's like yeah this is all good and it's vital like this this podcast doesn't get released without editing and finalizing each episode but is my time best spent on this versus something else and the answer is like probably not and i feel like it's the same kind of situation that you're going through with having to spend all that time in the kitchen is hours spent not growing the business or preparing for the nationwide launch or whatever else it might be. So like if you can hire someone else, food prep or whoever it is, that'll be your first hire. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So you have a good point with that. Um, it's like working in the business versus on the business. Right. And it's kind of like your tires are spinning and you're not really getting anywhere. And it's hard to going in for long days in the kitchen. And then I'm like behind on emails and everything. I get home like late at night and I'm like, Oh God, I don't have any energy left for this. 
So I do like, I have a friend who comes in occasionally and he helps me and I just pay him by the hour and he screws on like hundreds of lids at a time and helps me pack boxes and stuff. And that helps tremendously. But again, like I can't completely, I guess, offload all of that to someone else. Like I have to be there overseeing everything just because I've had issues in the past and kind of one of those things that's if it can't be reversed, if something goes wrong with the product and it gets into the hands of a consumer and there's something wrong with it. It's only temporary. I, I know like I'm just going to push through these next few months. You know, it's funny. My wife has a construction company that she started recently and I've I don't know how to word this properly to anyone. Like there's always like words like I'm always stuck with like what word do I use so that this resonates with this human being. And I think one of the things is like there's just you have to understand levers is kind of one of it. Right. And I think employees can become a, an amazing lever for your business if you just deploy it. And I think a lot of first time founders or people in your position there's this difficulty of, oh my God, hiring. I've never done it before. And so they, they spend six months thinking about hiring. And I like to my wife, she did this. And I was like, just put it on LinkedIn. Like you haven't even put a post or an Instagram story that you're hiring. Try that. And, and she's like, for three months, she didn't do anything. She was like, who's gonna respond? This is so difficult. So she does it and she's like, oh my God, like 10 people responded and I like them. And I'm like, you gotta get out of your head. You just gotta go do it. And then once you start realizing that the way I look at it is like the transition between employee, right? So right now you're, you're always going to be the best employee. There's no question about that. You're always going to put the lid on better than anyone else for the rest of time because you care the most, right? And so it's like you have to move from employee to executive where you're putting systems in place and really understanding the, the levers for growth, which come down to people. And once you can do that, you're like free. But it's a whole new skill set too. It's like right now you're probably you're like you've mastered basketball and now someone's asking you to go swimming. And it's, it's like, oh, but I'm athletic. And it's like, yeah, but it's a completely different game. And that I think is the hard part. And we get into our heads a lot around these growth steps. It's hard. It's super, super hard. Yeah, no, that's a great way of putting it and too. Like, yeah, like the founder is going to care the most 100% and like the company is growing, but the team isn't. So like you need to grow your team too. And I guess giving up control in certain areas is extremely hard. Like I know a lot of founders have this issue too, because you do it for so long and you want it to be yeah. so perfect. And it's like your baby and it's like, okay, you need to let go so you can grow the business and work on the business and then have people work in the business for you. So like I'm slowly, slowly letting go. Like I'm going to have a virtual assistant start to take care of like all my customer emails and things that just eat away at my time that I don't necessarily need to do. So bit by bit, it will happen. <laughs> That's great. Well, that's exciting. And do you ever plan to raise money? Like, do you think you'll ever do a big raise maybe at the end of this year once things are sort of set up and you can kind of come above and breathe for air? Yeah. Once I kind of get into stores and the value of the company goes up, then I think I'll start fundraising. We'll see though. I'm just taking it one day at a time. <laughs> yeah. How are your parents now? Are they like, this is incredible. <laughs> like, it's really funny even like friends too like starting out like at the beginning it was kind of really discouraging because my sales were like pretty flat like I would get maybe one or two orders a week and they would be from someone I knew they wouldn't even be from a total random person so I don't think sure. they even really counted but yeah like these past few months my sales have been like increasing like crazy and I can barely keep up and I went home for Easter and I was talking to them about like what my revenue is at for this year compared to last year. And they're like, what? Really? Like, that's crazy. And I'm like, yeah, it is crazy. Like, it took a while to get here, but like, it's, it's happening. And uh, yeah, like, they still find it hard to believe, but they're super supportive, especially now, now that there's money coming in. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. Is there anything that you've learned from your customers that surprised you? Like, is there a buyer that you're like, oh, I didn't see that coming? In terms of, in like, what way? Maybe like old people love your product. Like maybe they're like the 85 year old nursing home market just devours your product. And you would have never thought that would have been the case. I wouldn't say 85. Like I think the older generation doesn't understand cookie dough. They're like, why? Mm. Like I don't eat that. Like why wouldn't I just have cookies? <laughs> A lot of moms buy my product for their kids, which I thought was surprising because they like the quality ingredients and that it's lower in sugar and it's plant-based and yeah, they like send me pictures of their kids eating it, which I think is pretty cool. That's awesome. How much is your product for everybody listening? Yeah, so it's 12 servings, 12 ounce jar, and it's $14.99 Canadian. But we're also going to be changing that and changing the size as well when we bring it to market this summer. Are you making it smaller? Yeah, so I think it's going to be more so like a grab and go instead of a bigger jar. And then down the road, I'm going to offer a bigger size. That makes sense. Yeah. 
12 ounces would be a commitment for me. It'd have to be like, I'm really, I'm going for it right now. I'm cheating massively versus like the little hit. <laughs> and where can people find you in Canada now? So um, in terms of like stores, I'm in like a few mom and pop shops just around here in Ottawa um, and a couple in Quebec. But yeah, online, roto.ca, I ship across Canada. I do not ship into the States yet, but hopefully later this year that'll change. As far as the name goes... I love that you lean in hard to the whole bro aspect of Brodo, but honestly, like, I, so I've been watching a lot of Letterkenny recently, and when I first heard the name Brodo, I envisioned the two, like, the hockey bros, especially coming from out of Canada, and I was curious if there were any other names that you maybe considered before landing on Brodo, and what that naming process was like. Yeah, there was another one. I was going to do pro dough, like protein cookie dough, but I think that was taken already, actually. Oh, really? Pro dough just like stuck with me. I don't know why. Like it's like, I'm kind of a gym bro. Like my friends and I would joke around and be like, you even lift bro. And it's kind of one of those terms. And like, if someone reads the name or hears the brand name, they kind of know what it is, especially like if they're into fitness and with that added protein, like it's really geared towards those consumers who our health and fitness advocate. So yeah, Brodo just stuck with me and I trademarked it in August. And yeah, so it's Brodo through and through. <laughs> and just tell everyone where they can find you and support you, support the brand. Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram, Brodo Canada. You can purchase if you're in Canada, brodo.ca. And uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, Erica Rankin. Please do. Please follow Erica and connect with her on LinkedIn. She's outstanding. She'll provide you a good release. For your day it's uh wonderful to support no no i'm a big fan of what you're doing and it's exciting to see you, people lean in i think you're at least lean it's clear to everyone that you're leaning into social media and it's particularly linkedin in a very vulnerable way and i think it's what matters and it works and so it's like it's awesome it's awesome to see thank you yeah thanks for coming on the podcast yeah thanks for having me